Welcome to Synced On Air. I'm your host, Angelique Robb, and today I have a special guest from Bokashi Earthworks, Brandon Rust. Well, well, ugh, I'm tongue-tied. Welcome, Brandon. How are you today? I'm excellent. It's a great day. Uh, it seems like spring is going to uh, start early, so I'm excited about that. Oh, what? and that's in Oklahoma, right? We are in Oklahoma, yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for being with us today. Um, you and I just met through a mutual friend, Dr. Anna Peltseva. Hopefully, hopefully I've said her last name as well as uh, I can. But um, yeah, she told me all about you and the products that you have. So I'm excited to, you know, share with our audience a bit more about what you have on offer. But tell us a little bit about, I guess, how you got here first. Yeah, so my name is Brandon Ruth. I have Bokashi Earthwork. I started the company. Uh, I incorporated the company in 2020 when I moved out to Oklahoma from California. I'm originally from San Diego. And I actually got my uh, my start in the cannabis space. I was okay. um, cultivating in California for 18 years before I moved into the legal space in Oklahoma. And um, I taught myself agronomy and soil microbiology, and um, you know I've kind of advanced my educational pa path through ex extensive studies, uh, reading science white papers, and also through my mentorship with Dr. George Caltizes, who owns NASA Agricultural Technologies. The uh, engineering, he was a structural engineering director on the Apollo space program, uh, space rocket, and he did a bunch of other stuff within uh, NASA. So I've had, wow. a, yeah, I've had a really, uh, I've been really fortunate enough to have people that are exponentially smarter around me that have helped me um, in business and with uh, education, educating myself and kind of putting me on the right track. But what we do at Bokashi Earthworks is we manufacture soils. We also manufacture a microbial consortium called Microbe Plus. This is used um, as an alternative to fertilizers to help liberate things like phosphorus and cyclophosphorus, help with nitrogen cycling, nutrient cycling, and outcompeting pathogens. We also work with NASA Agricultural Technologies. They have a carbon-based fertilizer that is... Uh, carbon chelated with uh, fulvic acid. So it, it has a better nutrient use efficiency than conventional fertilizers without any of the negative detrimental impacts. And so that's another one of the products that we, um, that we, that we sell. And with that Humate fertilizer technology, we co-developed this product here. This is the NutriGrow pot. This is a replacement for single use plastics across agriculture. And what it is, it is a pot that is a manure base. It's coated in the humate fertilizer and it's a complete fertiliza uh, fertilization system. So the idea behind this is to be able to pop a seed or put a, uh, a cut, a plant into this pot. And once the plant's established, you can put it directly into the soil and it's going to release enough fertilizer for the entirety of that uh, uh, plant's uh, cycle. So uh, it, it's designed to essentially eliminate the use of additional fertilizers. It also decreases transplant shock because typically if you go to like Walmart or Home Depot and you get something for, you know, landscaping or for your garden, maybe it's tomatoes or some flowers, you know, typically it comes in a little single use plastic container. Yep. You have to disturb the root systems. You put that in the soil, then you add additional fertilizer and hope for the best. With this is kind of a easier solution to where you can plant that plant directly into the soil because it's uh, carbon based and because it's also a compost manure based it acts as a biostimulant to help uh, stimulate the soil microbiome and it also is ad adding additional carbon back into the soil and that's what we need right now because so many uh, agrochemicals they actually acidify soil releasing carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and other um greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and one of the things that that we think about in regenerative agriculture is sinking more carbon into the soil additional carbon into the soil to help with the proliferation of nutrient cycling 
and th tying things up like heavy metals and de uh, decontaminating that soil from things like pesticides and uh, environmental pollutants. Gosh, you've beat me to a lot of my questions. <laughs> no, this this is fantastic. So how long has the Nutra Nutra pot, sorry, Nutra Grow pot existed? Very new or very new. So we, you know, I I spent about a year or so doing R and D product development, and then I spent an additional about six months a season, um, testing the pot with uh, different crops, formulating the right formulation to make because the my first formulation was an eighteen fifteen eleven formulation, and it was way too, um, it was way too hot as far as the percentages of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus for seed starts. So I had to go back to the drawing board and reformulate. Uh, and now it's a 9-10-9 formulation. So it's a little okay. a little less on the, the fertilizer side. Um, and it worked a little bit better for seed sprouts. So, so, but you said very new. So how, how new is Nutri-Grow Pots? How so we've been are, selling are. for approximately two months now. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's very new. <laughs> we haven't we haven't even scaled out our production yet. We're still doing everything manually. So, um, you know, the the company is fairly new as well. You know, we we incorporated in 2021. We didn't actually start online sales until October of that year. And we've done really well over the past three years that we've been in business. But it's coming to a point now where the company is well we're looking for additional capital investments so we can expand because we have a project where we're going to partner up with nasa agricultural technologies to build out a factory to manufacture both the humate fertilizer and about 120 million units of these nutri grow pots wow. on a yearly basis so it's something that we're working on scaling up all of our manufacturing capacity right now because the demand for this product um i like I can't do any marketing on it yet or anything like that because it'll it's already selling faster than I can really produce it. Wow. So well, there is a huge demand. I mean, I think it's the the knowledge that our our pots aren't recyclable has spread, you know, over the last you know few years. And what are we going to do about it? And and you've you fix that. <laughs> so that's a big deal. <laughs> so, so who do you, who is your um, ideal um, market, you know, or wh that, where is? That's the best thing about the product. So my ideal market is everybody. And <laughs> everybody needs to eat, you know, every, um, a lot across the world are, are farming or doing gardens, or house plant or herbs in their kitchen. It's for everybody. Um, it's for the the nurseries that provide all of the landscapers with their pansy flats and their ornamental flowers, their seasonal, you know, their seasonal products. It's for, you know, the farmer. It, uh, one of the things that we're we're going to be doing is, you know, flats like this as well. Okay. If think about if you get a flat that says that has like 110 and maybe they're just one inch by one inch squares yeah. as a starter. And let's say they have 20 grams of fertilizer in each little one inch by one inch cup. If you start a, a corn seed in there and you plant that corn seed and you have 50,000 corn plants in a hectare acre, you have essentially 100,000 grams of fertilizer or 1,000 kilos. And so that, that hectare acre of land, once that corn is planted, all you have to do is proper water management and and it eliminates the use of additional labor labor additional fertilizers the the costs associated with fueling machinery and repairing machinery so the the idea is to have this as a global product you know when we're talking mm -hmm. about places like Nigeria and Dubai they there there are places that have really poor soil but their agriculture is exponentially increasing and so they've invested a lot of money in water desalinization and um, ways to mitigate the poor soil quality and bioremediate. And this is a, this is the a way to do it. I mean, yeah. you get to bioremediate while you're, while you're growing, fertilizing. Yeah. yeah. 
because it's it's made out of you know this is about 70 percent carbon by volume and so every time you put this into the soil you're adding additional carbon to the soil so after multiple harvest levels, you're gonna what you'll see is you'll see an increase in the soil or organic matter content wow and so what would you say and i mean i know in different countries it'll be um different issues but you know why do we need to remediate our soil what what's wrong with our soil today so if we look at soil globally there's only about two percent of the land mass of enough fertility and when we when i mean by fertility we're talking about soil structure water holding capacity available carbon that proliferates okay. microbes and the ability for um, those microbes to go through their metabolism and release secondary metabolites that cycle nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and micronutrients. We're talking about total availability of nutrient ions for that, for the soil. And if we look at, you know, 98% of our ag soils, they're deficient in both organic matter and nutrients. And so oftentimes when we are starting new plants of land, that land has to be worked. And, and typically in most agronomists that come from university settings, they use agrochemicals, things like diammonium, monoammonium phosphate, murate of potash, urea, potassium phosphate. These are all ag chemicals that are essentially salts. When these salts are put into water, there's, they, they, the ions are liberated. So you have these positive and negatively charged ions that are highly reactive and oftentimes they tie up other soil nutrients or they leach into our waterways. And so they have a very poor use efficiency. And um, I forgot what the, I just kind of went off on a rant there. Um, well, yeah. So, so I was asking about what's wrong with our soils. And so oh, yeah, it, yeah. it sounds like. Um, so conventional fertilizers tie up the things that are in the soil uh, oftentimes. And then most of the soil has less than 2% organic matter. Now, 5% organic matter is ideal. And it's because the, the organic component, even though it's only 5%, it's responsible for cycling the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is, is all the mineral appetite, all of the rock minerals, the clay, the silt, the sand, and all of the ions that plants use, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, zinc, manganese, copper, iron, all the things that they need are actually liberated and solubilized from the these appetite that's in the soil itself. And so when you don't have a big enough pool of organic soil carbon, the microbes that liberate those ions that make them available to, to, to plants and create new soil and aid with water and dynamics and carbon dynamics, those things are absent. And so those soils, the, producti the productivity of those soils are decreased. Carbon is the backbone for the plant proliferation of all life. And then, you know, the, and another issue too, is most of these soils don't have adequate amounts of the nutrients they need. Like you could be deficient in copper and zinc, right? And if you're growing a crop, you're not going to get those vital nutrients into that food source, which means we're not going to get it into our own bodies. And that's one of the things that we see today. Uh, most of the mental health issues, most of the uh, physical health issues are, Due to the fact that we're only eating carbohydrates, you know, we're not getting the mineral nutrition that's associated with the produce that's being cultivated because our soils are so minerally deficient. They don't contain proper levels of magnesium and zinc and copper and manganese and the things that our cells also need. So if we're deficient, if our food's deficient, if our soil's deficient in these nutrients, our food's deficient in these nutrients, and then our bodies become deficient in these nutrients, yeah. and it affects the way that our genes respond because what happens when you have when you have genes right they they will code with whatever resource is available to them and the way that i like to look at it and the way i think about it is you could have somebody writing out a letter and it's beautifully written uh, in cursive it's spelt really correctly and it it's you know it gets the point across and it's beautifully written you could also have that same message be scribbled the punctuation's wrong the spelling's incorrect. It still gives the same message, but it's really sloppy. And that's the way that gene transcription kind of works. Because if you don't have the right raw materials, it'll write it out still, but it'll do it really sloppily. And so when we want ah. the genes to transcribe, 
at the highest level that we call it the up regulation of gene transcription it what's happening is that that code is being beautifully written out and it's perfect so that way it can be read really really well and it mm -hmm. regulates whatever process that's happening on a biological level wow i didn't think we'd get into like even genetics of of our bodies <laughs> through this discussion but yeah it's fascinating to to hear how um the, the soil can directly impact people um, through there's what a, we eat. Yeah, it's, it's, there it's, is a, a strong link there, isn't there? Yeah. And, and the same can be said too with things like autism and dementia and things. These neurological disorders are oftentimes caused by nutrient deficiencies and also environmental toxins, glyphosate, heavy metals like arsenic and cadmium and lead. These things can contaminate our food and they essentially, what happens is those heavy metals are picked up during gene, gene, uh, during gene transcription. So I, a, a lot of the effects and the things that you see today health wise is because of this. And I mean, this scientists know this. It's why Monsanto merged with Bayer. You know, you have one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world that's teamed up with one of the largest food production uh, companies in the world. And it's because they understand food is and it all the soil in the in the base function of that soil is the organic matter in soil because organic matter creates new soils and liberates all of the nutrients that crops need for to be healthy well and so slightly changing the sub not changing the subject but but getting a bit more um you know into the movement of where you're seeing your product being sold like who's who's buying it to date um and and you know is that in our the landscape industry you know um i guess you know this yeah. podcast is um, more for landscape business owners and our, our industry. Um, and we want them to know about things like, you know, soil health and, and how yeah. they can help. But where, you know, where's your biggest uptake of, of purchasing of the, the pot so far? So we do most, well, it's about 50-50. So we work directly with farmers because there's a lot of people that are switching their methodologies and, and for all the reasons that we just talked about. You know, the, the nutrient use efficiency of conventional fertilizers, while you're doing conventional ag or whether you're fertilizing your lawns, because that's a huge, huge thing too. You know, we have, one of the things that was brought to my attention was the conversion of using electric in landscaping to decrease emissions from things like oil and gas and contaminating, you know, people's soils with those things. The same kind of concept concepts exist where there's new technologies out on the market that are safer, that, that aren't going to have env a negative environmental impact. Our main customers are, we're, we do a lot of DTC as well. So anybody who wants to cultivate on their own, I get a lot of people who are doing our home growers, people that are cultivating food, but also we work with uh, landscape companies who are doing a lot of turf and um, okay. of courses and stuff like that, because typically what you'll see is you'll see high, you'll see higher dollar uh, budgets for maintaining golf courses, right? Because they want to have those really nice green, yep. you know, that really nice greenery. But oftentimes the fertilizers that they use are really inefficient. Oftentimes we're using like urea and, um, they might have some additives where they'll add some EDTA chelated micronutrients with the humates, uh, it's safer, right? It's safer and more efficient. So the cost associated with, with what you're going to use and apply is less because you're using less and you're doing it less frequently because the fertilizer has a higher use efficiency. It's almost a hundred percent efficient and the reason why it, it does that is because it doesn't have any of the precipitation reactions that commonly occur with conventional fertilizers and it doesn't have any of the negative environmental impacts so for a homeowner owner who's you know wanting to fertilize their rose bushes and they're wanting to fertilize their um you know their lawns and all of their shrubs that they have for you know wind breaks and you know privacy barriers oftentimes what you'll see is um, the landscape company will apply conventional fertilizers, right? Very inefficient and they'll have to keep maintaining that. With our products, 
you it's very infrequently you may only be applying something a few times a year and having great great efficiency Oh, wow. Okay. And so that's from the, the liquid um, fertilizer that you showed us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so when you said 50-50, do you mean 50-50 um, direct to consumer, 50-50 B2B is what yeah, you're selling to? Okay. That, yeah. Because we have our website and the majority of home growers and stuff like that, people who are cultivating their own food, they just buy off the website. But then we get, you know, larger wholesale orders that are business to business and then wholesale for like garden centers. Um, yeah. Stuff like that. And where around the U S are you well, seeing well, most of the uptake? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm based out of Oklahoma, yeah. but my two biggest markets are actually New York and Oklahoma. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think New York because it's got such a high population density is, is maybe one of the reasons but I work all over because I also own an agricultural consulting company and I work on the North shore of Hawaii all the way to New York. I have some international um, businesses, uh, business uh, clients that we're starting to work with as well. So, you know, it's, it's spread out. And the goal is to just continue to continue our, our upward trajectory and growth. And, you know, I've been working, a lot in the cannabis space for a really long time. And a lot of great technology has come from that space because it's such a high dollar value crop. And a lot of people will spend more money in that space mm. for research and development and stuff like that. And so I've been able to really feature that and kind of change the, the, that space dra pretty drastically. And so now what I've been doing is I've been focusing more on the American association of agronomy places like your, your events where it's landscaping. Cause a lot of people, homeowners, they want things that are safer, that are pet friendly, kid friendly, mm -hmm. they want to reduce what people are more environmentally conscious now today. Yeah. And so it's really just about, you know, how do we increase the brand visibility? How do we get people to know that these products exist, how they work? Because a lot of, a lot of times it comes with education too, because nobody knows about fertilizers unless you're maybe an agronomist or a soil scientist or a, a nutrient formulator, you know, so the, the majority of the public, you know, isn't going to be able to have a really in-depth uh, co conversation on why these conventional fertilizers are, are so bad. Mm hmm but, you know, we try to bridge that gap with products like this, which are so easy to use and understand. Yeah. And so you can buy those on your website too, the Nutrigrow pots. Yep. And yeah. there's some I've started selling locally at the garden centers here. Um, again, it comes to scaling up this manufacturing because once we actually start doing a marketing campaign and we start, you know, really you know, gaining visibility. You need to be able to deliver. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, and I think that um, as an industry, um, the landscape industry is very interested in in doing, you know, everything better. <laughs> but it's just knowing that the, the products and how to use them. And um, so I think, you know, it sounds like from what you've developed, you've given a really great solution on the shelf right there and ready for people to pick up. Do you, um, I guess you've tested how, if you use this as a pot while you're growing the seeds, um, does it disintegrate over time or it stays um, in, in its shape for a certain length of time? Yeah, so I've had plants it for up to two months just sitting in itself. Once you actually get this into soil, um, it'll decompose within two months. Okay. Yeah. And the roots actually grow right through it. Cause a lot, of I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest questions I get, because there are other products on the market, right? There are like the Jiffy pots, which is a, which is a peat based compostable cup. There's other fertilizer cups, but they don't incorporate a complete fertilizer into it. And the thing okay. is with this, the roots grow right through it. And the, and then especially when the limiting factor is, is usually going to be uh, soil 
and our uh, air moisture and humidity because if it's really dry and the roots start popping out, they'll get air pruned. They'll just naturally prune themselves. But okay. once they're actually in the soil and you transplant it, the roots it will goes act crazy. Yeah, the roots will actually encapsulate the pot and completely, you know, decompose it and and assimilate it into its. System. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing what you've done in such a short time um, with this business. Where do you see, um, where do you see it going? Well, we're, <laughs> we, we're working on a, a capital raise right now. And okay. once we get the financing, what is going to happen is we're going to build out our own factory, which is great because the return on, you know, once we've maxed out production is around 50 to $70 million a year. So we're looking wow. at a small investment to build out a factory. And I'm really excited because that is going to allow me to keep doing things like this, going on podcasts, going to events, going to trade, educate, educate. Yeah. because, you know, as somebody who's been on, hundreds of podcasts who, you know, goes to, you know, all over the country to educate people to do agricultural consulting. This is in my wheelhouse and it's what I do best. I can convey the message of how these things work. I can break it down to people. Um, and the whole thing is like, everything's changing in agriculture. I mean, the USDA just gave out a $400 million agricultural grant. I actually applied for it, but at the time that I applied, I hadn't had three full years in business. They told me to reapply. But they're giving out tons of money right now to small businesses to decrease chemical dependency on agrochemicals because the majority of cheap fertilizers come from places like China and Russia. And if you look at like geopolitical uh, issues that are happening, a lot of people may yeah. not know this, but a lot of that has to do with natural resources and fertilizers. So uh, nit uh, hydrogen gas, which Rus Russia and China has a lot of, including what was um, taken from Russia to the to Europe, right, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline. That was a source of actually uh, nitrogen fertilizers because they use hydrogen gas during the Harbor Botch process to convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium fertilizer. So when you don't, when the price of natural gas increases, the price of fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers also increases, which also increases food prices. So we've seen that. Continue, we've seen food prices continually rise and it's a there's a direct correlation to geopolitical events that are happening globally um yes think a uh, rock phosphate it's it's we have about 60 years of rock phosphorus that's uh easily accessible has enough and is a good quality to maintain um our current our current appetite. yeah our current appetite for it and the global populations the I, I actually did a 10 minute little documentary on peak phosphorus and it talks about you know morocco china and the us are the three largest countries that have the most reserves but still we only have 60 60 years left and then we're like we're everything's changing and this is one of the things that people don't realize across all ag spaces we're running out of phosphorus right which means that all these like the usda that that's one of the reasons why they're implementing um money for incentives alternatives. yeah because yeah. the f the f pep is the domestic production and distribution project that that, that they put together because they want to increase um natural fertilizers the production of or uh, organic fertilizers and fertilizer alternatives because they know this is coming they know that it's going to get more difficult to mine it's going to cost more energy um, it's going to be, you know, they're going to have to go to places that have a uh, lower quality, which means the refining process is going to be more expensive, which means more energy, which higher prices, it all trickles down and that all affects food costs mm -hmm. and our health and so, our health. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, we have gone, you have gone into so much detail on this. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for educating us. I think that, um, you know, I, I did know that we need to start improving our soil um, through composting and things like that. But, but you know, you've spelled it out in in a lot more detail than I could have. <laughs> so, um, thank you for for educating myself and and our audience about this. Um, what do you suggest 
you know, landscape businesses need to do um, today and now in order to improve the soil? What what would your top tips be for direction? So not removing biomass. So oftentimes what I see is when somebody does landscaping, they actually collect all that biomass, like yard clippings, leaves. Leaves. When, when that material is actually removed, that material actually contains plant essential elements, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium. It also can is the majority of that is carbon, right? So what you're doing is you're removing carbon from that, that carbon sink potentially from that carbon. So uh, finding different ways to uh, recycle that green waste, either through composting or letting it naturally decompose on, on, uh, on those sites can actually improve overall soil health. And I understand that, you know, it might not look the greatest. I think that that's one of the things. So maybe, you know, in that situation, maybe set up homeowners with easy, easy solutions for composting that material. And then that material can then be reapplied as opposed to going back and cut and spraying all that, you know, cause I see that uh, it's like a, I think it's urea and it's coated and it's like painted green. They spray it. You see what uh, drives me freaking nuts when I see that. <laughs> It's like, it looks so artificial. It looks so tacky. It is the worst. And I'm just like, look at, they could be spraying humate fertilizer on those lawns and they're going to green up so fast that they don't have to worry about painting. <laughs> Damn grass. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that we could, we could do better. And I think you're right. Um, leaving clippings and leaves in place. And, and it goes back to how you design the landscape in the first place yeah. you know if you have pebbles underneath the tree that will be a lot more maintenance and you'll need to remove the leaves but you know okay maybe you know working around that you could say well if you blow the leaves into the flower beds or you chop yeah. them up and and um compost them like you said you know it, it can start with how you design the space in the first place yeah. and and how you construct it and then um again to to eliminate maintenance that removes good i mean like leaves are the best compost if you can leave them in place weeds grow like crazy in there <laughs> you know one of the things that I saw at the event when I was out there in Georgia was they have machines that will just mulch those things up really, really finely and, and make it really easy to compost those things. So if you are removing them, maybe have compost bins where you can reapply that compost to the flower sections. But when you're talking about agricultural design too, I think what's really important is to, to always keep resource management at the forefront you know, functionality. And when I talk about resource management, you know, we're talking about water, labor, yep. raw inputs, you know, time management, you know, how are these, you know, looking at runoff and water management, how is water being captured or how is water being collection on, collected on the site? Is that a possibility? Can you have collection barrels because you have a huge roof, you know, can you use that water or for, uh, for to get, for to getting the land? You know, those are types of things that I think that people should be looking at when they're designing things because we want to be as efficient with our resources as possible. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, that's really interesting that you mentioned water management or resource management because when I tell people about um, why we need to connect design, build, and maintain as an industry, I use water as an example because, you know, we've concreted up areas and now all of our natural you know irrigation our our rainwater um, gets pushed away from plants because of the concrete because of the levels even um maybe the concrete the is higher happening. yeah higher the hardscaping is higher um is sorry lower than the the planted areas and i see it all too often that all the water is running down the concrete into the gutters and our trees and turf and plants don't have natural irrigation um, because of the levels that they've been designed with or have occurred over time. And it, it's really, um, so water, nutrients, 
um, all of this ties into making a really strong design um, and and management plan for the site. And um, you know, we say we're we're short of people in our industry, but maybe we need to rethink that and look at look at things from a higher level on how we're resourcing, how how we're using our resources in the plan yeah. and 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 maintenance and maybe we need people in different parts of the industry than we think we do yeah i think there's a big crossover too because you know resource management is something that's extensively in crop production on acreage because like you mentioned water management you know you might not have the ability to have unlimited water so you have to manage that water properly you know, crop, you know, there's just so many different aspects that come to uh, um, soil management and being healthy and productive. I think another thing, too, for landscape stuff is when it comes to resource management is utilizing native species of plants that grow well in those certain areas, because that can help with water management. If you're, mm -hmm. desert, you know, you don't want to be growing plants that have to utilize massive water resources right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so using plants that are native to the area i think also helps with resource management too yeah and it's yeah. able to draw water deeper into the soil than you can with grass yeah 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 i think i it it, it is so everything so intertwined in our industry i think that's what keeps it fascinating and keeps us uh, needing to keep learning. So, uh, well, I've learned a lot about um, the soil today. <laughs> Thank you for that. And um, you've also been at our Sync Live event in Atlanta too. So, um, great did event. you did you make some good connections there and I feel did. like you got the word out a bit more? Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of great. There was a lot of great people there um the the interest in regenerative agriculture in the in a different space that I work in was uh was great for me because it's it's something new right and I'm mm -hmm. and I'm so work uh used to working in in a certain space and I haven't done tons of work in you know, uh, landscaping and design and stuff like that. And so it was really cool because there's so many different aspects, things like roofscapes. So it's like, well, how are you guys, uh, you know, yeah. roof, roofscapes, you know, people that are doing um, DNA testing soil to see what type of microbial populations are in there. I mean, there's all types. I've met a lot of really cool people. So, and the event was really nice. So you put, you did a really good job. I congratulate you on that. Definitely. Oh, well, thank fun. you. All the marketing was well done. All the integrations with the apps and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you. Know, I, I understand as a business person how difficult doing marketing and media and all of those back end integrations to make every make the functionality work. Um, so I commend you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're looking to get the word out a bit more in different areas around the country. So yeah, we'll have to involve you in future events too. So Absolutely. now one thing that some people might not know, that I have a question for you. What mm -hmm. is Bokashi? Okay. So Bokashi <laughs> is actually a Japanese word. It's a type of composting. And instead, typical composting is done where you aerate the pile. Um, and that is because Typically, if you don't, the water content uh, becomes really high, and then you get anaerobic conditions that proliferate the right, the wrong type of biology. So you'll get uh, microbes that are producing sulfides and methane and uh, ammonium gas, and those are not conducive to the to the overall health of that compost. Um, with Bokashi composting, it's a form of anaerobic composting where you eliminate the oxygen and that material actually goes through a fermentation process. So what you do is you inoculate your compost with this consortium, yeah, which is several, it's a different species of bacillus, lactic acid bacteria, a photosynthetic bacteria, and fermentive yeast. But what it does is it expedites that composting process. So typical compost could take between six months and a year. You can have compost between 30 and 45 days doing anaerobic digestion. 
oh, wow. And then that makes it easier for, let's say, if you, as a landscape business, you want to encourage composting for your clients. Yeah. It's not, not this want, huge you don't want mound. This huge, <laughs> you know, you don't want this huge stinky pile that you have to go out there yeah. and, and turn every week. And, you know, uh, I mean, people like convenience convenience is king it's why walmart is so big because you can go to one place and get everything you need right convenience is key so um one of the cool things about like bokashi and the microbes is like so food waste right so if you take like a little five gallon bucket with a little screw on lid i put all my waste in there and i throw in a little bit of those microbes and it actually ferments that food it breaks it down super super fast and that's nutrients that's soil nutrients yeah. it's soil carbon it's soil biology that you essentially you put there in your flower beds or in the beds that have your carrots and your onions or with your herbs and you're getting natural fertilizer. So you're getting yeah. things that are pest friendly, health, uh, earth healthy. Um, you're stimulating carbon in the microbiome. It's just it's a it's a win win. That is awesome. So 30 days is really quick. Um, yeah, I think that sounds like a great plan. I'm going to have to buy some. <laughs> If you send me, uh, send me your info, I'll send you some, you can try it out. I would do that. I'll do that. And then, uh, and yeah, maybe document it and, and publish are you it. Growing any, are you growing any food like vegetables at home? Are you doing any gardening? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll send you some fertilizer too. Cause if you're doing tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and stuff like that, you will have, you'll have probably too much last <laughs> year, last year I bought a house, um, last year and I and it was the first year that I set up my garden beds and my greenhouses and I had 16 pepper plants and I was filling up a five gallon bucket of peppers probably every three days consistently oh my for about for about four months. I had so much peppers I didn't even know what to do with it. And I made, <laughs> and I made salsa, I made salsas, ferments, all kinds of stuff and I just couldn't keep up. That is fantastic. Oh I grew loofah too. Let me show you this here. Oh, let's out. see. I'll be right back. Okay. So one of the things that I always like to uh, tell people is, you know, just being, being self-sufficient, producing anything that you can on your own land. And uh -huh. this, this is a loofah. So it's a natural sponge. And you usually see these in, uh, you know, like whole foods markets and stuff. And they're yeah. it's just as natural sponge. But we, we infused it into soaps, too. So we made soaps with the loofah that I grew. Oh, wow. So we do a lot of uh, so cool, neat. cool projects like that. And, it, it, <laughs> you know, it's fun. I like to grow stuff. <laughs> house plants, too. My whole house is filled up with plants. And I used to kill all of my house plants. I could not keep a house plant alive for the life of me and once i started using the humate i you know i feed them once every two months and you know i just keep them wet keep them i water once a week but every two months i give them a little bit of humate and my monsteras are huge my philodendrons are huge all of my my christmas cactus and awesome well i can't wait to try it I, I think, um, yeah, it's been fantastic um, learning about all of your products and what, yeah, how you came. I mean, it's it's amazing that you're, um, what you've done in such a short time. And I look forward to educating our audience about what you're doing and hopefully connecting you with more people so we can get this going. I am all about that. I'm, in, awesome. I'm excited. Thanks for having me on today. Thanks for being on our podcast, Brandon. Look forward to working with you more. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Have a good day. Bye.